Good afternoon. Um, welcome to my talk. Um, so the title of our talk today is Towards Continuous Computer Vision Model Improvement with Kubeflow. My name is Derek, and I'm a software engineer at Snapchat. A lot of the material presented in, in this talk today is actually done by my coworker, Ethan, and he unfortunately can't be here due to visa issues, so I'll be the only one giving the talk. Um, so first, a very quick overview about the agenda of this talk and what this talk is about. So first, I'll give you a very brief introduction about what Snapchat is, but it seems a lot of you are, are aware of us already, and that's good, so I'll keep that part concise. Um, next, I'll talk a bit more about this new uh, feature our team has been working on called Scan. Scan basically leads us to the problem and need of, of like, say, continuously updating and improving computer vision models. And more particularly, we are interested in um, improving the quality of visual understanding. So this is an important part to like, understand why we even need to have this talk. Next, I'll give a high-level overview of what we mean by model improvement and what kind of machine learning problem we are trying to tackle here and what kind of uh, high-level machine learning approach we are trying to uh, have as well. So after that, we'll do a case study and we'll discuss why we choose to use Kubeflow pipelines and what, what kind of alternatives we've considered and we'll also to describe the uh, pipelines we have built. Um, finally, we'll chat a bit more about s some of the pain points, tricks, or practices we've seen and hacked all together while using Kubeflow pipelines. So let's get started. First about Snapchat. So our app has been around for eight years, <clears throat> and what is Snapchat? So basically, we consider ourselves to be the most fun way to share the moment whenever you want to, to, to do so. And at the end of Q3, we have over 210 million daily active users. So we have more than 3.5 billion snaps created every day and shared with your friends. And we also have over 600,000 lenses created by our community. I do want to explain these two words a bit more. So the first here is what is a lens? So as you can see here on the right-hand side, a lens is basically an overlay that you can add to your snap that creates an augmented reality experience on top of your content. So basically, a lens is, is meant to be fun, creative, and makes your snap more engaging. And the lens you are shown here is one of the most popular lens we built like four years ago called Puking Rainbows. <laughs> and then on the term community, so basically, we have this app called Lens Studio. So Lens Studio enables you to create a AR lens from various kinds of templates. You can track two-dimensional content based on the movement of your hands, faces, head, neck, shoulders, etc. You can add animated two-dimensional or like three-dimensional objects to, to your world, or you can add images or, or animation to your cat and dog's face. Our users love this app, and they have created over 600,000 lenses from the, the available templates that we have. And here are some examples. So here we have four examples of commu community lens. So the first one is a lens that shows you her favorite sports team, and uh, I believe this is a Florida Gators, so it's an overlay on top of her face. The second one adds a stop sign based on the movement of the hand. In the third snap, we can see this cute cat now shooting laser be beams from her eyes. And the last one is an animated uh, 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 3D object that I believe is a uh, butter? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> so like, if you're interested to create more lens like this, you can always learn more at lensstudio.snapchat.com. But as I've just said, we have over 600,000 lens lenses like this, which is both good and bad. Good thing is our users now have a lot to choose from. And the bad thing is they have a lot to choose from. Because when you're taking a snap, it's very hard for you to know like what's the most perfect lens or like what's the most engaging lens you can possibly use for the content that you want to share. Like if you have a cat or your or if you want to take a snap for your favorite cat, and you don't even know we have all these cute pet lenses at all, what can what can you do? 
So our solution to this problem, or okay, more precisely, our attempt to solve this problem leads us to this new feature called scan. Uh, so here for scan, we aim to find the perfect lens for the content of your snap. Overall, what we want to do is, when you start a scan request, you can press and hold uh, in the Snapchat app. This basically fans out the request image to a bunch of different algorithms, like we have an object classification model, we have hand detection model, we have sky segmentation model, we have an instance retrieval algorithm that tries to match your image against the list of marker images that we have, et cetera, et cetera. And then after this, we, what we now have is a list of highly confident concepts or say instances that we've predicted from what your image content has and we'll try to match it against a lens database that we have. And then we would retrieve a bunch of lens and uh, these lens would be used to, we will then do personalized um, sorting for all the lens you have and then give you a list of suggested lens tailored to the content of your snap. So as a result, if you take your phone out, open Snapchat app, and press and hold on this cat, which we've just seen from the previous slide, you should be able to see a list of lens like, th like this. Yeah, so now if you don't know what you can do when you are taking a snap or what kind of AR effect you can add, now we have a way. And then you, you may want to stop me right now because you feel it's already 2019. I can't be talking here and uh, acting like this is still a hard problem, right? I, I mean, you might say I shouldn't be thinking I'm doing this or this or even this. It's like, most likely in my day to day, I'm either doing this or doing this, right? To some extent, I think you might be right because these days all you need to do to get a good baseline model is you can import your favorite deep learning framework, be it like TensorFlow, PyTorch, MXNet, Chainer, whatever, and then you download a pre-trained checkpoint from a large image data set like ImageNet, Open Images, these sorts of things, and then get that trained and fine-tuned on your limited annotation data. You have do all kinds of tweaking, do all kinds of hyperparameter tuning, get it to a decent validation accuracy, deploy quite a bit. That seems to be what most of the tutorials of uh, computer vision models seem to be telling us. I mean, this will give you a good baseline to start. So what do we actually mean by continuously improving? And this leads us to the second portion of this talk, which is a high-level overview of what model improvement means and what we are trying to do. What we've learned from all basic machine learning courses or machine learning one-on-one -on -one is your model would be as good as your training set, and your model is only as good as your training set. What this means is um, if your training set sucks, no matter what kind of model you try, your model would likely suck. So this is an image we get from our internal user feedback. Um, basically what happens is after we finish the first um, release candidate of this scan object classification model, our internal user told us, hey, uh, I'm in the furniture store and uh, I see a bunch of cat lens related to this and I can't apply my cat lens to any of them, so can you fix that? So we took a look and um, apparently we found this image is now incorrectly classified as cat, and then we are suggesting pet lenses that e users can't apply. So this is a bad experience that we want, we want to fix for sure. You, you might argue that this is incorrect because our training process probably has a bug, our network structure might be wrong, or like, or like these sorts of things. Uh, I'm concerned about that too. So months ago when I first saw this, I did a few tests. I actually did this test last night. And if you download this image or 
crop it, upload it to some kind of cloud vision API or some visual understanding API that you can find online from very major companies, you'll find that at least two or three of them now still classify it as cat or animal. So this means maybe it's not because our training process has a bug. And I would argue it's basically, it's basically because in our training set we've never seen these sorts of images, which I believe is a fluffy pillow of some sort. To illustrate what, what this means, let's take one of the largest image data set that we now have open images as an example. So what we have here is interesting because right now I can't even see that on my screen. Nice. So <laughs> what we have here is this is the open images data set released by Google. It has over 9 million images. And uh, here are the images that are tagged as uh, positive, uh, that contain pillows. So here, if we scroll down, if we take a quick glance, we can see there are various, uh, if anyone has, can tell me where my cursor is, that would be great. Okay. So if, if we scroll down, we can see there are various kinds and shapes and textures of pillows from this image set, but it's not easy for us to see the same fluffy or like furry kind, which basically means we can't, we, we won't be able to tell this because we've never seen that. Okay, so after this, the very natural question is how do we fix that? Uh, or how do we actually, like how do we effectively leverage limited user feedback to effectively improve our um, classification model. And almost always, when it comes to model improvement, one of the most effective approach is to get more training data or get more labeled instances. But here, the main issue is, what kind of training data do we actually need that can correct predictions like this? Because we only have like one or two or like not more than a handful of user feedbacks. We can't train on those. The overall idea we have is conceptually very simple and straightforward and also a very standard machine learning approach. Basically what we want to do is to rely on similar images that we can find on Snapchat. And more, more precisely what we want to do is to find images that come from a similar distribution as our scan requests but look similar to the user feedback images where our predictions are incorrect. So in Snapchat, one of the potential data source we can use is called our story. So our story is this type of story posts that users specifically choose to share to the public world. And then we can use them to annotate them and try to improve our models. So I want to do a live demo of what I mean. So I'll try to see if this would actually work because live demo is always risky. Uh, so this is the feedback. And I haven't considered, I can't even, I don't know where my mouse is. Okay. So here I want to fetch the top 100 most similar our, our story post. I click this uh, and then after an Embarrassing, embarrassingly long wait. So we found a bunch of images that look like furniture stores because it's very likely this image is taken in a furniture store. So if we scroll down, we can see that most of the uh, posts we have here do come from the same type of um, places. But it may not be exactly helpful for us to correct this case. Luckily for machine learning, based on the um, activation maps, we can kind of understand which part contribute to the highest activation based on the prediction values we have. So if we like crop the highest, like the best region of interest we have, we do a, we do a, we query again based on this portion, we now should be able to find more fluffy stuff that looks might be helpful because like you can see here, some of these are actually animals. 
Some of these are not. But so this kind of positive and negative combinations would help our neural network learn which are the most important features to try to tell these part of things like from the cat, non-cat type. You may argue this is not that important in terms of fixing uh, user feedback, but people do love cats, so. <laughs> and after this, the next slide is a backup slide in case demo failed, and luckily I don't need to use that, so. And next slide is an another backup slide. <laughs> okay, so here's a high level overview of what our end-to-end -end workflow is. So um, basically we have two sorts of input. One is a search index that, that, is, that should support nearest neighbor queries. And this search index is basically built from our story posts. We would compute image features on top of that and then it's used to support querying visually similar images. The other sort of input are a collection of seed images. So these seed images, they may come from user feedback, they may come from scan request image logs where the model is uncertain about or other types of active learning um, strategies. So these seed images are then used as queries against the image index we have here and then it will give you a list of candidates. So these candidates are then fed into some third party annotation services and here we use SageMaker ground truth. So we then split this image into training set and evaluation set. We will combine this new training set with the existing training images we have, retrain the whole classifier and see if it meets some uh, performance criteria for like updating and then we will deploy again. So you can see this whole thing now forms a closed loop of a machine learning workflow that aims to improve the model quality automatically or continuously. So this is the high level overview. And uh, although this is still a very standard machine learning workflow, it's way beyond what a, what a machine learning engineer can comfortably experiment in his Jupyter notebook. So we need some other better tools. And then in the next portion, I will chat a bit more about why we choose to use Kubeflow pipelines, what kind of comparisons we've made to other pipeline orchestrators and an overview of the Kubeflow pipelines we've implemented for the machine learning workflow that we, we've just seen. So as we all know, so basically Kubeflow pipelines it, um, essentially is a pipeline orchestrator. And there are already a lot of pipeline orchestrators one could possibly use. So why Kubeflow? We listed several requirements that we would hope our pipeline orchestrator would have before we dive into and uh, start implementing everything on this pipeline orchestrator. So the first thing is we, we, we would want it to be able to run arbitrary or containerized code because this would give us the maximum flexibility in terms of component language choices, packages, etc. It should be able to share components easily across different workflows because um, then multiple engineers or teams can build these shared components where people can then provide common functionalities that shared across multiple experiments. It should be able to reuse and modify previous workflows because uh, then we can enable quick ML experiment iteration because we are trying all sorts of new ideas every day that may or may not work. So it's, it doesn't make sense to simply assume that most of our pipeline specifications would remain fixed most of the time. Ideally, we would want it to be Kubernetes native as well because in that case, we can minimize our gap between the experimentation computing environment and our production environment so we can easily understand uh, or have better estimates of runtime performances and other performance metrics easily. It should be able to use GPUs because, I mean, well, we're doing deep learning, so it's important. Uh, ideally, we would want it to avoid vendor, um, like it shouldn't be completely dependent on a specific vendor as well. And we also wanted to be able to specify workflow as code, so these pipeline changes are 
meaningful and other engineers can review these changes as well. And finally, it would be nice if we can have some nice metric visualization output either natively or by integration with other tools like TensorBoard. That's a long list. So late last year, while we were trying to decide which pipeline orchestrator to use, um, eventually we've narrowed down to these three choices. Uh, some of these comments I'm making here may no longer be valid because it's been a year and a lot of things has happened in the past years. So I'm afraid maybe Airflow now supports this now, but to be honest, I'm not entirely aware. So the first choice we've considered is, is AWS step function. So it's widely used in, a, in, in AWS land. It has very tight in, integration with almost all the AWS native uh, support uh, and other cool AWS stuff it has. But we feel it's a good workflow orchestrator, but it's not a very good uh, workflow orchestrator for machine learning experimentation use. It's not Kubernetes native for sure. And the way we, um, we specify workflows in AWS step function is basically these state machine JSON strings. So it's not entirely, it's not easily understandable. And there is no way for us to quickly see what kind of metric output each run has. And Airflow is widely used by a lot of companies for sure for their data pipelines, and there are a lot of nice things I love about Airflow. But Airflow at that time, one of the main thing is it wasn't able to integrate with Kubernetes easily, and as such, we won't be able to use GPUs, which means if we were to use Airflow, we need to rewrite a lot of our code into cloud platform uh, machine learning training engines like SageMaker or Google Cloud ML engine, which is like one thing we are trying to avoid. It doesn't have visualization support as well, and one of the main thing I think uh, is Airflow is good for recurring tasks, but it's not super easy for you to uh, change existing DAGs or create new experimental DAGs. So it's good for recurring tasks, but may not be that good for quick experimentation. And obviously, at that time when we were looking to Kubeflow pipelines, it supports all our needs, and we went all in to implement our machine learning workflows in Kubeflow pipelines. So here's an overview. I hope the font is still recognizable. Um, so this is an overview of the pipelines we've built from the previous model improvement machine learning workflow. So basically, we've split the overall like uh, giant workflow into four mini pipelines. The reason behind this is we still don't have artifact caching in Kubeflow pipelines yet. So once we make any tweaks or updates in the, the downstream components, we don't want to rerun everything, especially considering some of these pipelines actually contain like involve human annotation, which might be pricey. So the pipeline implementation part is actually relatively straightforward, given everything is already dockerized, and basically we now have four parts. The first part is a candidate image collection pipeline where we said it, uh, we can have multiple sources. We can fetch visually similar images from our story, or we can fetch from our scan request logs. The second pipeline is where we feed data to Sage, SageMaker ground truth for annotation. One thing to note here is we do cross-cloud data transfer due to pricing or other feature considerations. So we inject AWS IAM key as secrets in our cluster, so data transfer can be done easily. So the second pipeline basically does some customized pre-processing, like we, we need to blur the face of people from the image posts before sending them for annotation, and then we would just pass these uh, processed images down to SageMaker. The, so the third pipeline basically creates the uh, sharded data we need for uh, training and evaluation. So here we would pass the uh, annotation data back to BQ and create sharded TF record files using data flow. So here what we've done is we've created a, a, an additional wrapper around the official KFP component for starting 
data flow jobs uh, to use Python 3 and also to fetch the output of data flow jobs and then pass them downstream easily. And the final portion of the pipeline is simply a wrapper that starts a SageMaker training job and handles customized evaluation uh, and then tries to see if this new classifier can be updated. So, so overall, this is our way of, imp Im of implementing the model improvement workflow, and these pipelines are now helping us to improve the production model quality automatically or over time. Uh, so for the final part of the talk, I'll share some of the pain points we've seen while using Kubeflow pipelines. They are also some of the practice or hacks we've come up with, and uh, I personally understand a lot of these ideas are far from ideal, so I, I also want to hear feedback or what other engineers do for, to deal with, with issues like this. So in our original talk proposal, the words I've used were, uh, we will also discuss best practices for authoring Kubeflow pipeline components based on our experiences from developing and deploying these components for production use. I would say that's not really the case, because when we first adopted Kubeflow in last year, like there are a bunch of issues we are seeing almost every day, and we've implemented a bunch of hacks around this. And at that time, I personally, or we personally, consider them as best practices. And after six months, or after like 12 months, a lot of these things have changed completely, and these so-called best practices these days are no longer best practices, or even practices. So basically, I think as an engineer, I've overestimated what we came up with, and I also underestimated, underesti underestimated the feature release uh, speeds that the Kubeflow team has. Like even comparing Kubeflow now to Kubeflow in April, where we, where we came up with this, these words here, I think I'm definitely already seeing a version that's much easier to use and supports way more features that, that I personally consider are extremely important for machine learning experimentation. So hats off to the Kubeflow team. And uh, that said, there are still two issues that I personally, I haven't found good official solutions yet, so we have proposed some hacks, and uh, I want to chat a bit more about them and share why we are doing things in that way. The first thing is artifact caching. And uh, as I've mentioned before, we are basically splitting our entire machine learning workflow into several mini pipelines because we don't have artifact caching. The, the motivation behind artifact caching is very straightforward because uh, if the upstream input hasn't changed, if the, if the upstream container image hasn't changed, arguments hasn't changed, we shouldn't need to rerun all the things. And here, a very natural assumption is most containers should give you deterministic output. And even if we're operating under that assumption, but your container it gives you non-deterministic output, we can still always add a placeholder argument that changes in each run. So ideally, we think we should need support from Argo or KFP team to handle this. But before we have that, the hack we're we are proposing right now is very simple. It's basically a Python decorator that computes a UUID output for GCS pass, given the input container args as well as your container image tags. So basically, at runtime, what this decorating function does is it checks whether the cache file already exists and the writing operation has already done. And if yes, it'll it'll skip all the work and it'll simply write KFP component outputs based on what is already stored in, in the cache. Uh, as I said, what we need as input here would be the image tag and container args. So we have container args easily. We don't have image tags. Uh, but we do need them. Otherwise, if we update the image itself but we don't update the input, we do want to rerun the whole thing. Luckily, uh, image tag is actually stored as pod annotation in Argo. So one thing we do is we simply use the 
field reference and pass this uh, metadata annotation down as uh, environment variables to the KFP component pods. And uh, that's basically how we get the image ID and then do all kinds of hash to see if we should skip the computation. This approach would work for a bunch of very standard cases, but it also has a bunch of drawbacks that I can't really uh, advocate. The, the first thing here is since we are already passing down additional environment variables in KFP for all containers that we have, basically what we need to do is we need to wrap the container operator class in KFP SDK as well to automatically do all these kind of things because we can't rely on all engineers to do these things in a manual steps. And uh, one more thing is it's definitely not language agnostic and then engineers who use other languages need to implement the same functionality in their own way. The implementation is highly storage platform dependent as well, which is also bad because in the newly um, launched uh, Kubeflow thing, I think they have a new data exchange way that based, that's based on Ming.io, so after we updated uh, this new approach stops working, and uh, that's one thing I do want to fix. <laughs> um, also, it won't work for components that don't have uh, file output, and uh, we won't be able to reuse public components online without hacking into the code and making these kind of customized change as well. So overall, we feel it makes more sense for these kind of artifact caching change to happen in KFP backend for sure. But if you're eager to implement a hack as a workaround, I feel this is the approach that could possibly work for you if you're dealing with standard tasks. The other thing I want to share a bit more about is how do we add type constraints between different KFP components. Um, basically, the, the issue here is after engineers have, have contributed to like tens or hundreds of KFP components into your component store, it's not entirely easy for us to know what kind of data each component expects since all of them basically read unstructured data all the time and then parse it in an arbitrary way. So this means engineers also in downstream components, basically they have no information about what kind of types they are expecting while, while implementing their code. Uh, and uh, this is actually okay if, if you're dealing with small scale pipelines, but once your pipeline grows large, it becomes unmanageable. And our current workaround to this problem is also simple as well. So we basically define a shared KFP schema package that centers around each experiment. And then all components used in that experiment should import the same KFP schema. So basically this uh, package here now enforces all components to share the same set of intermediate data typing uh, information. However, as you may see here, this, this again means this package itself is not language agnostic for sure. We can use protobuf, but I feel that's too heavy as well. So th this means in the long run, if we have larger pipelines, it'll be very hard to handle these changes as well. Uh, in the past few months, I think m one of the new features introduced by Kubeflow team is a new Kubeflow metadata feature. And uh, we strongly believe that the information about these metadata data should be tracked uh, in other places as well, which means we, sh we sh shouldn't be tracking these schema information in KFP. So in the future, what we'll, what we'll also tr try to do is to explore this route and see if this will become our holy grail to type management and artifact tracking. That actually is the end of my slide, and I didn't prepare a thank you and Q&A slide, but Thank you for coming to my talk, and uh, I'm happy to take questions. So, questions? And I think it's the coffee break after, so I think we could go a little over if the AV people don't get mad. <laughs> um, I'm curious, uh, when you mention about the, um, the artifact caching, 
Um, you said that you will probably need um, support from Argo for that. And I'm curious why the artifact repository that is provided already for Argo uh, is not enough for, for the tasks that you've been trying to do. Uh, the question is why doesn't artifact repository supported by uh, support by Argo work for the artifact caching use case? Correct. That's a good question, but my next question for you is what is artifact repository? <laughs> because, like, to be honest, I mean, I, yeah. So, so you can, in, in Argo, you can configure um, your artifact repository. It could be S3, it could be. Uh, oh, 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 I see. So that part, that, the thing here is in, in terms of that, I think that only gives you the way to automatically store your output into some kind of data storage layer that is configurable. But whether that can whether that can skip the computation is another layer of logic that lives independent of that, right? Um, you mean for input? Yeah. Yeah, you can definitely bring input from an artifact repository. No, no I mean, like, even if that's the case, does artifact repository automatically skip computation if, if the input and arguments are the same? Uh, to learn that, no, no. You definitely need to have some logic there. Yeah. So, 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 because I think you still basically need to implement the same hack in your components as well, right? Got it. Yeah.